Good morning. morning. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, this is the first day with a new, well, with one hour less. So praise God for the one hour less. Amen. Amen. We'll appreciate it on the tail end where we have a little bit more sunshine. (laughs) Amen. Won't get dark as early. Boy, it seemed like when I was a little kid, like it would be like 10 o'clock before it got dark. Good. Remember when your mama says, you know, the street lights come on, you better be on your way home. Hallelujah. So we used to love the fact that it seemed like the street lights would stay, on, stay off so long. We just plan and plan and plan. Well, thank God for daylight savings time. Amen. I greet those who may be with us via social media. Perhaps you did not set your clock so you couldn't be here with us personally. Just want you to know some of us made it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We do greet you in the name of the Lord and pray that you would indeed have a wonderful and prosperous day. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our God, thank you. Lord, thank you for the word of God. It is the liberating factor in our lives. God, open up the eyes of our understanding, cause us to know the hope of the calling that's upon us. God, I pray that you would stir us, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one. God, calls us to see the time we're in and the time that we have left in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, good morning. I want to uh, go into the word of God today uh, with not much ado, but I want to also show a little appreciation. Thank God for the ladies who were able to come out on this weekend. Amen. I stuck my head in on Friday night, and it was, it was a wonderful thing to see. So I, I praise God for you all and the celebration that God allowed you all to have. Thank God for the brothers who were uh, of great assistance. Amen. Men who inconvenienced their schedules to be a blessing. So thank you for your assistance in the matter. We are indeed... Uh, proud of the fact that God can use us as people to minister to other people. Yes. That's important. You know, sometimes people, are, it's easy to want to be ministered to, but it's another thing to allow God to use you to minister to other people. So thank you for your availability and your usability. So now let's go into the word of God. Amen. Amen. I want to speak to you from the subject. Well, Let me give you a scripture first. How about that? Go with me to Psalms 145 and 15. And then I'll tell you my subject. Psalms 145 and verse 15. The Bible says, The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. So the eyes of everybody and everything is waiting on God. Because he's the one who give what we need in our due season. Today, I want to talk to you from the topic, making preparation for the due season. Making preparation for the due season. Now, I know when I say due season, people have certain ideas of what that means. I think by the time we'll finish, you'll be very clear on where what I mean in reference to due season from a biblical standpoint here today. So the eyes of all wait upon me and thou givest them their meat in due season. Due season. What does it mean? I know we've heard several different things in the course of time and oftentimes when we hear due season, we think about us personally. It's my due season. Can't wait till my due season comes. And we think of it in a personal uh, respect. And nothing wrong with that. That's not inappropriate. But there is a way to also understand due season. So let me give you, according to Psalms 145, what the author is saying in due season there. Due season means a fit or proper time. 
So it could be you waiting for your fit or proper time. Due season also means opportunity. So it could mean you in your opportunity. You're awaiting your opportunity. You're awaiting your fit or proper time. Nothing wrong with that. So, since we're talking about making preparation for the due season, how do we prepare for the due season? We okay? I know it's going to, I need to work a little harder today because I understand you lost an hour. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. It's okay. It's okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. I totally understand. Thank you. I totally understand. Number one, since we're going to prepare for our due season, you and I must learn to wait on the Lord. If it's a set or a proper time, if it's an opportunity, we can't rush it. We can't make it happen. I know we like to hear that we're going to make it happen, but you really know you not making it happen. Let, let me say that again. You really do know you not making it happen. Yeah, y'all going to make me work today. Oh, my goodness. Did you get any sleep? Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's okay. Thank you, Dr. Hall. I thank you. I, I need just a little support go a long way today. Hallelujah. Amen. So you and I must learn to wait on the Lord. Go with me to Psalms chapter 27. See, I want to talk about really being prepared for this. I want to be ready for this. And I believe you're going to see what I'm saying as we move forward. Psalms 27 and verse 13. Psalms 27 and verse 13. The psalmist tells us, he says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So wait a minute. I had fainted. I'd have been out of here. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So we have to believe that we will see the goodness of the Lord here. See, there's a misconception that the goodness of the Lord is for when we get in glory. That there's no goodness to be seen here. Remember, I, 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 I'm not, now I'm, remember, I'm talking about a due season. If we're not careful, we start doing. OK, let, let me show you something. Since, since, since I got a little time for y'all to wake up here, you know, social media is an interesting platform. Because social media, for the most part, deals with a world that's not real. It's a fantasy world. Uh, you don't see social media don't show you necessarily. Well, let me let me put it like this. We project on social media. Folk look happy. They on vacation. How come they do? How many people you see putting work? They, they put themselves working on social media. I mean, going to work. I mean, in, in the throes of working and taking care of children and raising a family. That, that ain't what you see on there. It's the glamour shots. People have learned to smile for social media. Not a real smile, but a social media smile. Because after all, I don't want you to really see the pain. I want you to see that everything's wonderful. I was telling my wife, I said I was looking at a particular uh, thing on yesterday, and it really, it, it just struck me. And for some reason, I started watching this. Uh, it was a gentleman who was talking about social media, and I had no real interest, but it's something he said, and he was talking about the, I didn't know what an IG model was. I'm just saying, I didn't know. And this guy was doing this thing about IG models, and I was like, what is an IG model? And, and what he said was so interesting. He, he was showing, showing how these IG models were making all this money. I'm like, what is an IG model that's making all this? I, I am like clueless. So I'm looking, and he shows this excerpt, and it has pictures of the IG models. And they in this private plane 
oh, it's decked out. So he's talking about the money they're making and all of this. And then he says, <laughs> his whole thing was exposing how fake Instagram is. And I was just like, really? I said, you know, because I'm not on Instagram. So he goes on, he says, do you notice something about these three photographs? And it was all three, it was three different IG models. And if you look at it, it had the similar background. And then he showed this little clip of where you can go and take a photo shot, show photo shoot of the interior of a fake plane. So they got all of these people thinking they live in large and it's a doggone fake plane that don't even, it, it's just, it's, he says, look at the chipboard on the outside of there. Ain't nobody want to fly or nothing like that. It's not even real. But they have thousands of people following them. It's fake. But see, do you believe to see the goodness of the Lord in this world? Not in a fantasy world. Because, see, we can blame people for doing that in that world, but some Christians are doing that in this world. I don't believe in the fake world. I believe to see the goodness of the Lord here. Right here. That's what the psalmist says. The goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. What report are you believing? So many reports of how bad things are, how terrible stuff is. You know what? God made light in Goshen and darkness in Egypt. Yes. I believe he could still make a distinction between the people of God and everything else that's going on around us. Yes. But whose report are you believing? See, this is all part of waiting on the Lord. So just stay with me. Just stay with me. If you and I are going to be prepared for the due season, we must learn to wait on the Lord. Let me just bring you back around. Hebrews 12 and 3 says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Listen to this. People faint in their minds, then they show it in their actions. People faint in their minds, and then they show it in their actions. You say, well, man, so-and-so, they backslid. They don't, no, no, they, they quit a long time before you saw that. They just quit in their mind first. That's why the battlefield is in your mind. What are you thinking? Show me what you're thinking and I'll show you where you're going. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Show me what you're thinking and I'll show you where you're going. People faint in their minds, then they show it in their actions. Y'all ready? That's why we got to learn to wait on the Lord. Look at verse 14 in Psalms 27. Bible says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. See, waiting on the Lord is spiritual stamina. It's not a case of exercising superior willpower. It's spiritual stamina. Case in point, listen to this. Proverbs 24 and 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. See, people don't have spiritual stamina. See, it's one thing. Can you imagine if we all get out here and we're going to run 10 miles? We're going to find out how much stamina we really have. Waiting on the Lord is going to determine how much spiritual stamina you really have. What kind of spiritual conditioning are you in? Have you developed your ability to wait? I don't like waiting on nothing, Pastor. Well, okay. Then your strength is small. And you subject to fainting during adversity. We have been taught that waiting is like the doctor's office. You ever realize, why do we have a one o'clock appointment and then you don't see me to one thirty? At least. Why don't you just say, come in and left at one thirty, and I'll be there. I, you, you know, just, just being honest, because I feel like sometimes I'm like, I might as well be late because y'all ain't going to be on time anyway. 
So you go like, okay. And, and then they have a nerve to give you a waiting room. This is the room you wait for your appointment. I thought if you made an appointment. Is it just me or am I the only? See, so we learned to hate waiting. Because we think when God says wait on him, that that means the same thing. No, let me show you something. Remember when you were in college, freshman year. You started that first, I mean, here, the first session. You walked into class, but you know what was on your mind? Graduation. <laughs> no, remember, see, you, you never, okay, wait a minute. You never went to college thinking you was going to be there forever. Right. On your mind was graduation. But you had to take classes. You had to study. You had, I mean, so many things you had to do personally. But do you know you were waiting on graduation all of that time? Because we think waiting means doing nothing. Actually, waiting means preparing. That's why God has us waiting, but it's because we're doing things while we're waiting. The tests that are coming in your life, the classes that you're taking in your life, the things that you're going through, but it's all in preparation for graduation. You're waiting all of that time. This ain't about just sitting still going like, when God going to come? No, it ain't like that. He here. Professor's been teaching you classes all along. He's here. But there were some prerequisites before you get out of here. There's some courses that you needed to take as a freshman that you couldn't get as a senior. They were prerequisites. We need to make sure that you really in this thing. You know, how many times you changed that major? You flip and flop and back and forth. Well, I don't know if I want to do this. You, how, how many folks came in? I'm going to be a mechanical engineer. That's when you came in. <laughs> you take that, they, they slap that big calculus book in front of you and you say, whoa, maybe I can reconsider. <laughs> See, do, how bad do you want it while you're waiting? How bad? See, because they're prerequisites that you're going to have to take before you get that due season. Before you fall up into that last course. Isn't it amazing that the courses in the beginning, do you ever, I don't know if you even realize this, are harder than they are in the end. They say, well, it's because it's in my major. No, it's not just that. Because, you know, if you look, you go like, why didn't you just get this to me in, in the beginning? I didn't have to take all that other stuff. Why don't you just give me what I wanted? Because you had to qualify first. Do you really want this? So now you're going to have to go through those prerequisites. So you can graduate. Oh, come on, come on. Sometimes I'm waiting. We got to we learn how to wait. People don't like, you say the word wait, they just ah, ah, t- start turning up their face and everything. Because we don't like waiting. But waiting on God don't mean that you're just sitting still doing nothing. It ain't that you just sitting in your house waiting on the rapture to come. Waiting actually has you engaged in developing spiritual stamina. The ability to wait on God in the midst of things. I'm going to show you why in a minute. Just, 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 I just want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. In Proverbs, like I said, in Proverbs 24 and 10, it said, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Because, see, it's the Lord. He's the one who strengthens our heart. While we're waiting so we don't give up. Amen. So you're not going to get the strength unless you wait. Amen. That's, That's what gives you the strength. That's good. You know an amazing thing? You don't get stronger unless you add some weight. Mm-hmm. I need the resistance of the weight to get stronger. I need some resistance in my life to get stronger. Lord, strengthen me. I need some resistance in my life to get stronger. Lord, why is all of this coming in my life? Because you want to get stronger. I need some resistance so I can build up my strength. Because I'm waiting. Just, just Just keep walking with me. 
Galatians 6 and 9. Bible says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not. Then in verse 10, he says, as we have therefore opportunity or due season, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Make your opportunity count for all eternity by not fainting. Don't faint. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give in. Wow, Lord, I see everybody else getting black. All these testimonies, Lord, when my time going to come? You, you know, and I've heard people say, well, you know, it's just like standing in line. And, you know, did you see the person up in the front of the line? They get there. Does that mean, you know, of course, we're going to move up to the next person. So you're getting closer. That sounds real good. Unless you're in the back of the line. If you're in the very back, it just make you go like, how long is it going to finally be when it gets? See, that, that, to me, that's really not the way it is with God. When you get blessed, I get blessed. Let me tell you why. Wait, 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 wait. See, see this, this is what people don't understand. See, in the line analogy, it's individual. In the kingdom, it's corporate. I'm connected to you. You connected to me. That's why we should be able to rejoice for one another because we connected. That's why I ain't mad at you and hating on you because you got this and you got that. Praise the Lord. God is good. I'm celebrating with you. I ain't just going like, yeah, I'm going to celebrate with you to my stuff. No, it ain't like that. It ain't like that. See, that moves you to another realm when you start. Well, we, we connect. We all in this together. Now I'm like, okay, the blessings of the Lord are on us. Yes. It ain't just because. See, we got to get away from that because if you're not careful, all you want is yours. You really don't care that somebody else got theirs. But how can I be connected to you, know what you've been going through, and then see God deliver you from it and not rejoice with you? Well, y'all... Yeah, yeah. Y'all, y'all, let me, y'all, I feel a little better now. I feel like we're waking up. Listen to this, Hebrews 12 and 1. Hebrews 12 and 1. The Bible says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed or surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, it's me and you, lay aside every weight and the sin. Oh, Pastor, I'm a saint. And, the, you know, this was written to the saints here. This was written to the saints. So get rid of your weight. Get rid of your sin, which does so easily beset us. But then he says, an oxymoron. Let us run with patience the race. Well, I, I thought whenever you run a race, it's about being fast. Not in the kingdom. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. See, this race requires us to be patient as we prepare for a fit or proper time and as we prepare for our opportunity. Be patient. I'm running with patience. I ain't comparing myself to everybody else. I ain't looking to see what, well, I, 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 I'm so far behind in life based on whose schedule. Whose schedule are you on? I need to be further along than this. Really? See, but, but see, these are the pressures that life will try to put upon us. And the reality is we have to keep a kingdom mindset because we must learn to be patient. We must learn to wait on the Lord. Amen. Amen. Number two, if we're going to prepare for our due season, you ready for this one? Let me take a little time here now. Catch my breath and let y'all relax. Not only must you and I learn to wait on the Lord if we're going to prepare for our due season, but you and I must not be presumptuous. Now, I know some of y'all 
was just moaning with that, and you didn't know what presumption means, and it's okay. So I'm going to show you scripturally. I'm going to show you just how we, 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 we have to be careful. And if, I don't know if you caught this, but I am saying you and I, so you understand I'm in this with you. I ain't come here to preach to you. I'm preaching with you. Today I'm proclaiming with you. So you and I must not be presumptuous. What do you mean, Pastor? Presumption has to do with overstepping our bounds. Presumption has to do with us taking certain liberties. You ever seen when somebody tell a story and they, they let you know, well, I'm going to take a, some liberties here. So that means they're going to they, they take some liberties by putting the story in the context that they want. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You ever see things that they say is based on a true story? Yeah. It's based on a true story, but this may not be the way it happened. We're going to take some liberties. It's just based on a true story. She might not have been the one that killed him, but it's based on a true story. You know, we're going to just paint the picture the way we want it. So you and I must not be presumptuous. What do you mean, Pastor? Go with me to Psalms chapter 19, verse 13. As believers, we've said things like, Lord, forgive us for the sin of omission. You know, Lord, them things I didn't know about. God, forgive me for the sins of commission. Those things that I've done, Lord. But then we think about the presumptuous sins. Oh, you see right there, it's in the book. But you know, omission and commission sound real good. It sound real cool. But presumption don't necessarily sound like that. The, sir, the, the, the man of God or the, uh, the, the, the psalmist says, Keep back that servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. So presumptuous sins is a great transgression. Why don't we talk about that? Why would you not talk about a great transgression? Got your attention now? Okay. Galatians 5 and 1. Bible says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Why would he have to write and say, don't be entangled again in the yoke of bondage? You know, you have to think about that. Okay, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. So stay in the liberty in, the, in which Christ has made us free. Why can't we just stop right there? He had to come back and say, and, conjunction, hooking some things together here, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Let me give you something, and then we're going to explain where I'm going with presumption from the scriptures. Because God has set us free, it's not a reason to assume we can handle things on our own now. I'm going to say it again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Because God has set us free, it's not a reason to assume that we can handle things on our own now. Sometimes it's easy to become prideful and arrogant. Let me show you what I mean here in a little bit. You know, your struggle may not be my struggle, but it don't mean you don't have a struggle. Amen. So why you look at me funny when I talk about my struggle? See, sometimes we can act like I'm delivered from everything. You are delivered from some things. But you do know you have a struggle. It's just the one that you don't want nobody to know about. I don't care how close they are. You don't want them to know. Can't nobody keep secrets like God. Because he got all ours. <laughs> he got all ours. The you that you don't really like, he know about that. The you that you don't show nobody, he know about that. He still love you. 
Go with me to Joshua chapter 3. Let's, let's find out what is this presumption? How does this work? We need, to, we need to keep ourselves from presumption, you and I, if we're going to prepare ourselves for this due season. Joshua chapter 3, you are aware of in the story that Joshua is the one that God has uh, anointed and established. Moses is now dead. Um, when you look at, there were only five people that actually made it um, out of Israel from the original crew. All of the other ones died off in the wilderness. Then there was Miriam. She died off. Aaron, he died off. Moses died off. So there's only Joshua and Caleb left. Just a little quick history. So Joshua is the one that God chose to bring the children of Israel into the promised land. So they're preparing to come into the promised land. However, there's a barrier between them and what God promised. We know the barrier as the Jordan. So here you are on the threshold of receiving all that God promised for you. You've endured your wilderness experiences. You found yourself coming to the place where you're about to walk into the promise of God. And I'm talking about presumption. What in the world could I be talking about? Joshua chapter 3 I want to go at verse three. I want to just jump there since I gave you a little background. The Bible says, and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God and the priest, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Listen to this. Every season has its own instructions. Let me tell you what I'm saying inside that. Don't bring last season's instructions with you to go into the new season. See, that's presumption. So look, look let, let me, I'm, I'm just trying to take a little time. It says, commanded, they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. So every season has its own instructions and don't move until you get the new instructions. They on the precipice of going into what God promised them, but you don't go until you get the new instructions. Just because you can see it don't mean it's it's yours to grab. See, a lot lot, lot of things, God must want me to have it. Yeah, but what is, did you get any instructions? Verse four, he says, yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. You ain't been this way before. Okay. This is a body of water, but it ain't the Red Sea. Are you feeling me now? I know you you walked up, uh, you stood in front of some water before and things happened. But I just want you to know this ain't the Red Sea. I know you've been delivered out of some things before and you're standing in front of what God's promised to you. But I know last time you went across on dry land at the Red Sea. But this ain't the Red Sea. Verse 13 of Joshua 3 says, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above and they shall stand upon a heap. What are you saying, Pastor? This ain't the Red Sea. This time somebody got to get their feet wet. Yeah, yeah, last time you walked across on dry ground. This time, somebody got to get their feet wet. So you can't assume that because God did it that way last time, 
and it looked the same to you this time that God going to do it the same way. That's the sin of presumption. You became presumptuous. You thought you had it now. You thought you knew what to do. You thought you didn't need any new instructions. After all, it looked the same to me. It's just a body of water. <laughs> Being presumptuous can make you miss out on the fit or proper time. Being presumptuous can make you miss an opportunity. It can make you miss out on your due season. Because you thought you can get it from here. Look the same to me, Lord. After all, I know what to do. Do you notice that when Joshua and them stood there, think, I just want you just for a moment. Let's really just kind of take this in. For 40 years, they've been hearing Joshua, you know, he, he's, he, he's lived through all of this. He's been hearing that we're going to the promised land. Him and Caleb, they went and, I mean, they've seen the promised land, brought back fruit from it. Now you're standing literally on the threshold of it. And in between you is one last barrier. Why didn't they just run on across the water? I mean, you know, do something extraordinary. I mean, you, you know how we think. Why don't we just, I'm going to walk on across the water this time. But no, it says that they were commanded what to do. This is what I want you to tell the people, Joshua. So in other words, even with this situation being on the threshold of what God wants us to have, there's still some instructions we need. Yes. We can't assume that we got it from here. We can't assume that we know what to do. We can't assume that it just looks similar to me. So after all, it's going to work out. They could have said, well, you know, this is what God want me to have. He said, no, this time I literally want the priest to step in the water. And I'm going to do something you ain't even seen. You're going to step in the water here and the water going to cut off up there. We got to get the instructions because not getting the instructions mean that we were presumptuous. And being presumptuous is a sin. Just want to make sure it's clear. My last point. Not only do you and I have to make sure that we learn to wait on the Lord. Not only do you and I want to make sure that we do not become presumptuous. But finally, look at this. You and I must maximize our due season when it comes. You and I must maximize our due season when it comes. You know, you, you hear people, you know, they, they want their time or their moment or whatever. God's going to do this for them. And I get that. I'm with you. But if you're going to prepare for that due season, you need to, you need to maximize it. Yes. You need to make the most of it. Yes. And that's why it's important that we learn to follow the instructions. That's why it's important we learn to wait on the Lord. All of those contribute to us maximizing our due season. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14. Very familiar passage of scripture. We're going to take a little while and look at this because I believe that this is very important. Because I don't want to wait on the Lord. I don't want to rid myself of all the presumptions and then not maximize what he gave me. I want everything from it. I want all of the benefits from it. I, I, I mean, if you're going to go through all of this, why would you forfeit at the end? So I want it all. I, I, I'm like Tatra Bet. I want it all back. I ain't meant, not, not, not every bit of it. So, so, so. I mean, I understand some people are, uh, you know, praise the Lord. Oh, but I'm trying to maximize my due season. Second Kings 13 and 14. Familiar passage of scripture. 
The Bible says now Elijah was fallen sick of his sickness where he, he died. So what the text is telling us that Elijah is going to die from the sickness he has. So the text is letting us know the prophet is sick. You have a moment because the prophet is sick. He's not gone yet, but he is transitioning. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So the king comes to him and he's lamenting, he's grieving, he's mourning over the prophet because he knows the prophet is transitioning. Oh boy, I'm going to find you here. I'm going to find you here. The king is sorrowful and he's grieving because a patriarch, a father of Israel, is about to transition. There's nothing wrong with mourning and grieving the loss of loved ones. There's nothing wrong with going into the mourning that's necessary when you see a matriarch or a patriarch leave off the scene. There's nothing wrong with that. Look at verse 15. And Elijah said unto him, take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. Let me share something with you. And I know I even sense now that there's someone that's watching me via social media and they're dealing with loss. They're dealing with the loss of someone very dear to them. And I want to say this to you. The matriarchs and the patriarchs in our life were preparing us for the work we must do in our due season. They were preparing you for what is to come. Nothing wrong with mourning their loss. Nothing wrong with uh, grieving over their transition. But I want you to know that they were preparing you for the due season. They were preparing you for what's coming. They were preparing you because they knew the torch had to be passed. So what are you saying, Pastor? Don't let the grieving and the mourning distract you from the work. You can mourn and you can grieve. God has no problem with that. But know that there's a work for you to do. They didn't pass the torch for nothing. They didn't share with you what they shared with you for nothing. They didn't teach you what they taught you for nothing. There's a reason because of the work that you're called to do in your due season. Don't be distracted by the grieving in the morning. It has its place. By all means, grieve. By all means, mourn. But you do know that there's work for you to do. Verse 16. And he said to the king of Israel, put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elijah put his hands upon the king's hands. Oh, my goodness. Listen to this. There are some things that God is doing in this season that will require you and I to put our hands on it before we know what it means. I said again, there are some things that God is requiring of you and I to put our hands on before we know what it means. What are you saying, Pastor? When you see hands in the scriptures, it often means control. There's some things that come under our control that we don't know what it means yet. We don't know what's going to unfold from this. I, I got my hand on it, but I don't know what you're doing, Lord. You told me to grab this, God, but I don't know what you're doing. This is the season you're going to put your hands on some things. And you're not necessarily going to know what it means yet. Are you with me? Look what the text says again. And he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. I'm a king. What am I doing with a bow and arrow? What, 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 I, I, I sit on the throne. Why in the world 
Do am I the king? Got a bow in my hand, Elijah. Are, are, are you a little senile here before you pass it? What's, what's going on? Don't understand what this means. So the Bible says, he says, put your hand on the bow. He didn't ask all of the questions we would. You know, sometimes people tell you, well, you know, they wasn't in their right mind. He said, put your hand on the bow. The Bible says, and he put his hand on it. Done what he's told. Then Elijah put his hand upon the king's hand. See, these things may look normal, but the impact is covered in the prophetic. Oh, no, I don't even know if you caught that. Because the king put your hand on the bow. Jesus. Now let me put the prophetic on it. I can't put the prophetic on it until it's under your control. It ain't that I couldn't pick it up by myself, but I needed you to control it so now I can put the prophetic on it. You sitting up here trying to figure out what it means up here. When God said it's prophetic, I need you to just do what I tell you to do. I'm going to cover it with the prophetic. Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. Verse 17. And he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot. And he shot. King still ain't got a clue. Like a lot of us. Can you do what God says do without knowing what it means? No, let me say it slow. Can you do what God says do without knowing what it means? He said, open the window eastward. So now the king is opening the window. Bible said he opened it. All right, that's what he said do. Then Elijah said, shoot. He said, I don't know what I'm shooting at. What am I shooting at? I don't see no target. What I'm doing? But it says, he didn't do all that. It says, and he shot. And now watch the prophet. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. God will give you the instructions for your own deliverance. You may not know what you're doing, but you're delivering you because you're obeying instructions. He's shooting his own deliverance. So what if he starts stuttering like some of us? Well, God, what this mean? I don't know. How the prophet already dying. You don't know how much time he got. You need to move with some urgency. This ain't a debate. This ain't a discussion. This ain't about having dialogue. He said, do this, do it. I'm a king with a bow in my hand, opening windows and shooting arrows now. Yes, you are. And now it's your deliverance. You just shot. You were instructed on how to have your own deliverance. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on. Look at this. Verse 18. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. So you take them arrows and you hit them on the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. There are moments in this season that must be discerned beyond their face value. No, no, no. I know you know the story, but don't run on. I want you to make sure you hear what I'm saying. There are moments in this season that must be discerned past value. In other words, you can't just look at this thing and judge it. The Bible says in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 2 through 5, it talks about not judging after the seeing of your eyes or after the hearing of your ears. You can't just grab this and say, you know what's going on. It's going to have to be discerned. You have to discern what's going on when he said, now I'm going to put this in your hands. He said, smite the ground. I want you to hit the ground. Put it in your hands now. Watch this. I'm put it in your control now. See, they have to be discerned beyond their face value because they need to be maximized. No, are you hearing me? They need to be maximized. Are you getting the maximum out of your due season? 
Because you're going to have to discern it to get the maximum out of it. Yes, it's your due season, but are you maximizing it? See, I don't want enough to get by. Verse 19, and the man of God was wroth with him and said, thou shouldest have, thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hast thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but three times. Because he only hit three times. Listen to this. The ability to maximize our due season is in our hands. The ability to maximize our due season is in our hands. You can't blame God. You can't blame somebody else. The man of God put it in his hands. And he said, now smite the ground. He only done it three times. He should, he should still be beating arrows now. Until he says stop. <laughs> See, if we don't maximize if we don't properly discern it, we're not going to maximize it. Do we even know what's happening? Are we even aware of what's going on? Or are we so, you know, are we so caught up in our world of going on our job, fussing over whether we got to wear a mask or not? <laughs> All of these trivial things to distract us so we don't discern the time. We don't discern what's in our hands. And therefore, we don't know what to do with it. Because all of a sudden, we're distracted. Let me help you. The king was at war with Syria. And what did the, what did the prophet put in his hand? He put in his hands weapons of war. Let me let you symbolize what you can do. And show me what you want to do with what I'm giving you to symbolize what you can do. You only hit the ground three times. You had the opportunity to absolutely consume your enemy. But you didn't discern it. So now you can't maximize it. I see, it's too late to say, well, give me another chance. You got one opportunity. You want to maximize it. You're with me now? The ability to maximize our due season is in our hands. John 9 and 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Make good use of the season you have because night is coming. Night is coming. My final scripture and we'll close. Revelations 22 and 12. Jesus says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. You determine your own, your own reward. It's according to the work you do. Nobody else is determining your reward with Jesus. You are determining your own reward according to the work you do. You and I have a fit or proper time. You and I have a due season. You and I have an opportunity to secure our reward. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? Everybody says they want their due season. But what are you going to do with it? Every head bow, eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, I have sought to share your word with your people. God, those who are here physically and those who may be watching us, Lord, at other times to come or even at this very present time. God, I pray that you would speak to each and every heart the importance of learning to wait on you, the importance of not practicing presumption, and the importance, Father, of being in a position where we can maximize our due season when it comes. Lord, we need you. We desperately need you. We need your spirit to lead us, to guide us. 
Father, help us in this time, Lord. Jesus, you walk this earth. You know what it's like. You know what's going on. You know what's in the heart of man. And we're dependent upon you for guidance, for instruction. Help us, Lord. I pray for those who are now in situations and circumstances. They're making decisions. God, I pray for those who are grieving, Lord, because they've lost individuals. God, I pray that you will pull them out of the grief and the mourning long enough to see that what was being passed to them now must be carried out, that they have a work to do in this due season. I pray, Lord, that they would be sensitive enough to know that the Spirit of God is compelling them to run on with the torch, that the torch has been passed to them. I pray, Father, that they would recognize this is the moment that they must maximize. Lord, I know that they may be holding something in their hand that they don't understand right now. They may be controlling something that they may not completely understand, but give them to know it's covered in the prophetic. Give them to know that you are prophetically watching over what has been entrusted to them. Let them use it for your glory. Let it be maximized in this due season. In the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, I pray. Amen. And amen. Glory. Hello. Thank you for taking the opportunity to tune in with us on today. I believe it's a tremendous blessing to be able to hear and receive from the Word of God. I want to take an opportunity also to challenge you as you move further in not just hearing, but obeying the Word of God. The Bible speaks in Romans of the fact that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. However, it doesn't stop there. It also lets us know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And then it leads us further to let us know that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to meet the Savior today. An opportunity to meet Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. The one who died for our sins, who was buried, and who was raised again from the dead. Today, you can know him personally. I want you to take this opportunity to pray with me. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. I know that you are the son of the living God. And I believe that you gave your life for me. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. And I thank you now for saving me. Amen and amen. Listen, if you've prayed that prayer, you've just accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You are now part of the family of God. Your life has been changed forever. I want to encourage you now to be a part of a Bible-believing church, somewhere where you can be fed the Word of God. The Bible says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's important that you're hearing from God. It's important that you're growing in God's grace. I want to encourage you, find a place that you can connect with other like-minded believers and grow in the things of God. It will make all the difference in your new life as you live as unto the Lord. I also want to encourage those that may be watching now, and maybe you're already saved, maybe you're already part of a, a, a church, and you're just wanting to find somewhere where you can continue to grow in the things of God and add or supplement your faith. Thank you for taking this opportunity and allowing us to be a part of that supplement. Also, I want to say this. Some of you all may be watching and you say, well, how can I give to that ministry? How can I sow into that ministry? Well, listen, I want to encourage you to take the opportunity. We have an app that you can actually uh, download to your phone and you can give to this ministry at any time that you want to, or feel free to go to our website. You can go to our website and on our website, you will find, uh, an opportunity to donate. There's a donate button, click on that button and it will further direct you into being able to give into this ministry. Listen, I believe that giving is a gain and not a loss. Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible lets us know that he increases the fruits of our righteousness. When we give, the Bible lets us know that he causes us to increase. 
He increases the fruits of our righteousness. It's all because God has allowed us to partake in the work that he is doing in the earth. And that is giving. That is giving of his son unto us. So when we give, we have an opportunity to imitate what God has been doing for us all along. Because it wasn't that we deserved it. It was that God was so good that he was giving his own son on our behalf. I pray that the message has been a blessing to you. And I encourage you to come out, be a part of what we're doing. We're located at 740 North Main Street here in High Point, North Carolina. Feel free to join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. or every Wednesday evening at 7.20 p.m. God bless you and thank you again for being with us. God bless.